one is, is does this whole pandemic constitute an act of God? In other words, there's this clause in my lease that says if something outside of my control happens, constituted as an act of God or force majeure, that I then somehow have some relief per my lease agreement. And the short answer is probably not. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propello Media. In today's Ask an Expert series, we're going to be talking to Jonathan Kaiser. He's the founder of Kaiser, which is one of the nation's largest independent occupier services for commercial real estate. Now let's get started. I want to say welcome. Thank you, Jonathan Kaiser, for coming on board um, and helping us with this Ask an Expert series. Obviously, a lot of uh, change, a lot of disruption in the marketplace today. Um, so we're really excited to have you on. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is just have you introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about Kaiser and how uh, your role is within the commercial real estate space. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, so Kaiser is one of the largest independent commercial real estate firms of its kind in the country. We exclusively represent tenants. If you think about traditional commercial real estate, the majority of the firms primarily represent landlords and developers. And as such, it puts them in a conflicted position when trying to represent tenants, which is none more evident than in today's environment when so many tenants are in desperate need of rental relief uh, sure. to survive or to make it through in a, in, in, in a profitable way uh, past this COVID event that we are currently experiencing. So what we've been doing as a firm is educating, helping okay. other organizations um, figure out what they can be doing to navigate their commercial leases in this very uncertain time and how if they do need rental relief, what are the best ways they can be securing that? And so with that being said, I'll just launch right in if that's okay with you. That's perfect. Yeah, I know you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of great information on this deck, so let's just jump in. Good. So the, and, the, and the thing about this is, I'm going to speak fast because I got a lot of content and I don't want to waste your time because I know everybody's sure. busy. So I'm going to go quickly and I'm going to, I'm going to really try to nail a bunch of important pieces. Okay. The number one thing that we're seeing right now, the number one question that we're asking is what should you do about your rent if you're in distress? So should you just not pay your rent? There's a lot of bad information out there. My very strong suggestion is absolutely not. You need to pay your rent because if you don't, it puts you in a, weaker negotiating stance with whoever your landlord or landlords are. So the first right. thing is, is make sure that you're not just listening to the advice of some people out there that are saying, don't pay your rent, don't communicate, don't worry about it. Uh, that that's not factual. There will be some assistance. We've already seen some, there will be more, but you should assume that whatever you're contractually obligated on will continue to be that. So, so first of all, don't just not pay your rent. So, what are the common ways that you could get some rental relief if you were to be able to secure them in discussions with your landlord? Well, the first one's rental abatement. And we're seeing very little of this to be candid in today's environment. And that's where the landlord just says, hey, we'll give you three months of free rent because you're going through a tough time. And then after that, you, you can resume your rental payments. Not seeing a lot of that, although we have been successful in securing some of it, but it's kind of isolated situations. The second most common one that we're seeing is the deferred rent to the end of the lease. So that basically says, hey, we need relief today, landlord. What can you do for us? And they say, how about this? How about we take three months, two months, four months. We, you don't have to pay it today. And we just put that on the back end of their lease. If you do that, both parties kind of share in the, in the concession there. That's the second most least common one that we're seeing. And then the short-term rental deferment, number three is the one that we're seeing the most of. And basically what that means is that you get concessions today, one, two, three, four, however many months of deferred rent. And then as soon as that deferred rent expires, they take whatever that amount was that you would have paid and they put it on top of your next, let's say uh, six, nine, 12, or 18 months right. of rental stream. And so basically you're paying it back to them in a shorter period of time. Okay. That's the most common one that we're seeing. Um, on the blend and extend standpoint, that means let's say that you have one, two or three years left on your lease and you go to your landlord and say, look, I need relief today, but I'm gonna be an ongoing concern after this, but I really need some help. What if I give you another year, another two years, another 18 months of lease term, because what landlords need is additional term on their lease, Right. Um, to make it more um, profitable for them, make them be able to refinance their properties. That's how they value their properties, et cetera. Uh, so that's one thing that you could do as well is trade additional term on your lease for concessions today. And then the other one is 
how do you actually uh, get relief in a way where the landlord isn't put in such a position that the building potentially goes back to the bank? And so in one way you could do that is offer to pay the operating expenses on the property. And that way the lights can still stay on, et cetera, but you can still get some relief, but the landlord doesn't lose their property. And in the meantime, they could be negotiating with their lenders on you know, some sort of relief for themselves as their tenant, you or you and others are not paying rent. And I'm assuming that it's probably the larger tenants that that's gonna be more of an option for? It, 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 it's both. I mean, you're, okay. seeing, you're seeing tenants of all sizes. It really is unique to the situation. I think that's a, a common theme you'll hear throughout this, this quick, this quick uh, webinar is, that it's really a situation where every situation has to be viewed separately. Every landlord's different, every lender's different. So right. you have to really have a customized approach, which okay. I think is the important piece here. So what okay. if you can't pay your rent on time? What do you do? Well, the first thing is you don't not pay your rent and not communicate. If you really can't pay your rent and, and you're in significant hardship, which unfortunately so many of you are, then you need to communicate. You need to communicate proactively. You need to right. reach out to your landlord, have a very clear discussion. And the best way to do it is in a way where you say, here's where we were, right, financially. Here's how the impact of this whole thing is affecting us. And here's what we look like into the future. So what that does is it enables you as an organization to share with these landlords why you need the relief. So many tenants are just saying, help, we need help, we're not going to pay rent. That you're not communicating in a way that's incentivizing the landlord to want to work with you. Because at the end of the day, the landlord's biggest question is, are you as a tenant going to be an ongoing concern? Are you going to be around after this? If I give you relief today, are you going to be able to pay me back over time? Right. So you need to have your financials put together. You need to put very clear financial projections put together. And the landlords also want to see that you're exploring other avenues for relief, governmental programs, dealing with your other vendors, et cetera. That, and, and that you're not just going to them for some form of relief. And then make sure you have someone who's an expert um, on your side, a commercial real estate broker that's not conflicted, that's in your camp, and make sure you have a good attorney as well. Sure. So how, how are landlords responding today? Well, I'll do this one quickly. We're seeing it across the board. Some landlords are saying, pay your rent or else and sending tough letters. That's on the left side, the rejection. Most landlords are in that middle category where they're basically saying, hey, look, I don't want people to be taking advantage of this opportunistically, but if you really have a need, we're here to help, right? So let us know how we can help. You typically have to provide a lot of data and you have to prove it because they don't want people to take advantage of it. And even if you do, they're not necessarily guaranteeing they're going to help, but at right. least they're open to the possibility. And then the third one is empathy. It's that proactive, hey, I know our tenants are in need, so we're going to be you know, offering to assist um, in advance of any requests coming in. The Irvine Company is a perfect example of that. It'll be interesting to see what happens on the other side of these initial one, two, or three month deferment periods. Right. If this market doesn't turn around, as you know as well as I do, this could be something where people have to go back to the well and, and seek additional relief. Right. So for those landlords who are in that far left category, again, reminding you again, in that rejection category, or that seem to be in the rejection category, but they're at least asking for some information in the skepticism category, here's what we're seeing. We're basically seeing that landlords are, are organized. They're using good attorneys that are giving them advice. And the advice they're basically telling their tenant, their, 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 um, their landlords, so the attorneys are telling their landlord, just to be clear what I'm saying, that, hey, show empathy, show concern, but be clear about them honoring their agreement. So they're basically saying that hold, hold steady, but don't act like you don't care. So that doesn't really help you that much as a tenant, right? And a lot of times they're asking for a bunch of data. It's data they're never gonna go through. I mean, if the landlord's asking for reasonable data, give them the data. I mean, you, ha you have an obligation to do that if you're asking them for something. But some of the things that we're seeing in the, in the request are just never gonna be reviewed. And so you can push back on some of that stuff. And the other thing is we're seeing, sometimes we'll get the same exact letter from one landlord as we're getting from another landlord, completely different geographies, completely, completely different entities. So it shows that they're organizing in their responses. Right. So the important thing to know on that is that their first offer is definitely not their best offer. Just okay. because you get that first kind of 
empathetic rejection does not mean that that's their position. That just is the standard form. So you need to get past that. You need to be the squeaky wheel. You need to communicate. Don't just send them an email. Don't just send them a letter. Pick up the phone and call them. If they don't respond, call them again. Send them a letter. Figure out who the decision maker is. Sometimes the person you're calling, you're like, look, Jonathan, I've tried calling them. It's usually not even the right person then because the decision makers are open for conversations, right? So find them. Sometimes you may have to track the lender down and, and have conversations with both the lender and the landlord. And if you have multiple sites across the country, around the world, look and see, are you a tenant in a landlord's building in more than one place, right? Because then you could leverage that multi-city landlord in a way that could potentially drive. And then understand empathetically on your side, what the landlords are going through because everybody's in pain, right? So yeah, right. thinking about what's the other person dealing with and then trying to see how do you come up with a creative solution with something that helps get them what they need, but also gets you what you need. That is what we're seeing as far as bearing the most fruit. And the key is be collaborative. Don't be adversarial. Don't, don't, don't play the zero sum game. We're all in this together. We're all, in, we're, we're, we're all affected by this. So if you look at this as how do I work with people to find solutions, like my good friend John Mackey at Whole Foods likes to say, win, win, win solutions are always possible. And if you're not finding them, you're not being creative enough. So look for those win, win, win solutions. I think that's a great point. Thank you. So what are the other most popular questions we're getting today? Well, the first one is, is does this whole pandemic constitute an act of God? In other words, there's this clause in my lease that says if something outside of my control happens, constituted as an act of God or force majeure, that I then somehow have some relief per my lease agreement. And the short answer is probably not. Most of these leases were negotiated by savvy and smart and well-educated and experienced attorneys who, especially for the larger institutions, have been through this before. 9-11, the last you know, significant downturn. So most leases carve out rental payments as something that you can get relief regarding. That being said, you need to look at your own individual lease. And it's not just your lease that matters, it's who your landlord is, what their position is on what, on what uh, this whole pandemic means. If they're trying to utilize force majeure to their own benefit, maybe you could use it in return, et cetera. Sure. Where you are matters, your geography matters, what the government interventions look like. And I think ultimately the courts will decide what occurs here, unfortunately. You know, you look after 9-11, was it one event? Was it two events? Was it three events? Ultimately it went to the courts and we're already seeing that happening in today's environment. Okay. So what should I be thinking about with my new leases that are currently under construction? Well, the good news is that in most municipalities, construction is still considered an essential service. And a lot of the permitting departments, while their physical locations are closed, they developed really good workarounds and people working remotely. And in fact, in some of the cases, they're actually working faster because they've been able to uh, reduce the amount of workload because of the drop in the economy. But you, know, you need to be very, very thoughtful about what, what you're gonna do a rel relative to a new lease, particularly if it's under construction and the landlord is controlling that and the landlord is funding that. So you need to make sure you understand your lease. What are those construction timelines within your work letter? What are the landlord obligations? And what are the default positions? And what are your remedies if they don't deliver? In other words, if the landlord pauses, delays, or doesn't fund what they're committed to in this lease agreement that you've signed, what is your recourse? Well, first you need to know what your agreement says so you can understand what those are. If you probably have some sort of out or if it's not delivered by a certain date, you can cancel the lease, or you have some sort of material benefit until there's some sort of um, resumption of the tenant improvements back on track. But you need to understand that you need to have a good legal counsel on that as well. And then if you're not sure that the landlord is gonna be able to deliver on the space, you need to make sure that you're not dumping money right. into a property or into a building where you may not be able to occupy that. And then last, if you're coming from one building and going into this new building, right? You may have a lease expiring, you probably do, at, at a certain space, but if there's delays on getting into, into the new one, you could be subject to a holdover clause in your lease, which basically says that you have to pay a significant premium on top of what you're currently paying just to continue to occupy that space for a month, two months, three months. So again, understanding what that is, 
having very proactive communication with your landlord to make sure that you're not in a situation where you're now paying double rent or paying a premium or both. So question number three, what should you as a tenant consider regarding the leases that you're currently in the middle of negotiating? Well, first of all, high five yourself that you didn't actually already sign this lease because right. the world has changed and the terms that you were negotiating are probably no longer applicable. And not only that, but you may need to reassess your entire space needs and the utilization. A lot is changing in commercial real estate through this COVID process. So you need to make sure that the assumptions you were making before on how many people, how many people in the office, how you were gonna lay it out, that that hasn't changed. And so reassess, stop, pause. Uh, if, 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 if you're looking at doing a build out, consider securitizing the money that the mm -hmm. landlords are gonna be putting into that space. So some sort of escrow account or some sort of surety bond, some way to guarantee that the, the money is that the landlord is committing to putting into your space to build it out for you will actually be paid. At the end of the day, flexibility is everything. Yeah. I would much rather see my clients negotiating, you know, shorter term deals, short term extensions or leases with tons of options to terminate options, to give back space, et cetera, and pay a little bit of a premium for it then try to do a long-term lease. Long-term leases are not what you're doing right now. The market has just started to decline. And as right. a result, you don't want to be doing long-term leases before more drop occurs because it's going to get worse before it gets better. So at the end of the day, time is your ally. Don't rush. Be thoughtful and strategic and look for flexibility as you look to navigate this very uncertain time that we're in. Question number four, Jonathan, is now the right time to try to renegotiate my lease, right? I'm in a lease, I got term left on it, but hey, I'm hearing all this news out there about how everything's getting worse. Should I go to my landlord right now and try to renegotiate? Well, the short answer is it depends, but probably not for two, two reasons. Number one, at the end of the day, the market hasn't even started to realize the pain that is coming. And that will mean that there's not been a significant drop in real estate values yet to date, but it's coming. So you, again, you don't want to go chasing rates down uh, in, in the current environment we're in. Number two, at the end of the day, your business is going to trump whatever real estate market conditions apply. So if you need way less space, then the answer would be yes. Let's solve this today and renegotiate your lease. But if you don't have a driving need I would strongly suggest that you be very thoughtful and intentional yeah. about watching the market, seeing where it's going. Don't jump, don't do it. And then strike when the iron is best, when it's hot, when it's ready for you. You have more negotiating leverage today, but that's only gonna increase. If you just think about the economic numbers that we're seeing, right? You talk about layoffs, you talk about furloughing of workers. There's, there's a projections out there that say we could be up to 25% unemployment. If that happens, there's going to be a massive amount of space that hits yeah. the market. And that's going to create a good situation for you and increase your leverage as a tenant. So what happens, question number five, what happens if the landlord loses or gives the building the keys back to the lender? Huh? Well, a lot of tenants don't realize this, but there's a clause in your lease called an SNDA clause. And what that clause says is it, it protects you if properly negotiated, which unfortunately most of them are not, but if properly negotiated, it protects you as a tenant from the landlord giving the building back to the lender and the lender saying, you know what, we're not going to honor your lease. We've had clients where they received a letter that basically said, you have 30 days to vacate or else. And the clients were like, what are, what, what are you talking about? How, how, how could you do this? Right. Um, and they usually in today's environment, you know, most landlords, are not trying to kick out tenants in today's environment, right? Tenants are valuable in today's environment. There's not a lot of other tenants running around kicking tires. Um, but that being said, they could use it as leverage, right? They could use it as a way to gain leverage over you as a tenant to get things that you want. So you need to be very thoughtful about it. You need to be, un you need to understand that if this does occur, it's going to be a pain in the butt. Nobody's going to be able to make decisions. You're not going to be able to get answers. So just know that this is something that, that could happen. Be prepared for it, review your lease clause, keep close tabs on your landlord and their financial position so you can make sure that your tenancy is not at risk if indeed you don't have a well-negotiated SNDA clause in your lease.
So here are the top nine items in your lease that are the most important items you as a tenant need to review. First, go find your lease. Most tenants have it in a drawer somewhere or yeah. in a box somewhere and they haven't looked at it in years. So go find it, open it up. If you need help, our firm Kaiser is happy to help, but find these clauses because they matter and they're material in today's environment. Sublease okay. and assignment. We just got off the phone with a client where they had to give a 40 day notice to the landlord of an intent to sublease their space. There's no tenant looking for sublease space out there that's willing to wait 40 days in today's environment. Right. It's moving too fast, which is very prohibitive. So you need to understand, you're saying, hey, well, I could just sublease the space. Well, maybe you can and maybe you can't. You need to know what your lease agreement says. Understand your late penalties. Understand your critical dates. Just because the world is on fire and you're stressed out doesn't mean you should be missing critical dates. You know, internationally, there's some interesting things about this where like in some markets, if you don't exercise a termination option by a certain date, your, your, your lease auto renews. So that, imagine that. You didn't even know that was in there because you hadn't reviewed it. And now right. you just have an auto renew. Right? That can yeah. be very detrimental to your business. Understand what default means. Default can be a scary thing. That's why you don't just not pay your rent. Because default provisions should, could include the ability of the landlord to make all of your future lease payments accelerated to today, kick you out, and you, st you still owe all that rent. So you need to be very thoughtful about your risks as a tenant and know what your lease agreement says around defaults and how you cure those. Here's an interesting one, number five. There's a lot of lease agreements that say, if you vacate your space or don't beneficially occupy it for 30 days, you're in default of the lease. Well, how does that work if the government is telling you that you can't occupy your space? So again, it's very interesting provisions. Some of that's gonna be played out in the courts, but you need to know what your lease agreements are. We still are a, a nation of laws and of contract law, and so you need to know what your contract says. All the things that a lot of people said could never happen, guess what? Eight and nine are things that people said will never happen, right? non disturbance yeah. internment almost never happens. Business interruption, and force majeure, almost never happens. So you need to be very thoughtful about it. Last thing on this, number, se number seven. A lot of tenants in their leases have a clause that says, it's called restoration or something like that. And it basically says that you as a tenant have to restore the building or your space back to a condition it, that existed prior to your tenancy. That could be a multi-million dollar price tag. And many tenants don't even know that it's there. So understand that and make sure that you're aware of what that means. And that could be something that you want to make sure you can get negotiated out or you could use as, as a way to improve your lease terms as the market continues to turn more and more into your favor. Sure. So what do we expect in the future? What can we expect from a commercial real estate standpoint looking for? Well, first, I think everybody in this COVID environment today is experiencing both the pros and the cons of working from home, right? I mean, there's, there's an element of efficiency, there's an element of you know, focus, but on the other hand, I am seeing so many people just craving that social interaction at an office environment or a distribution center environment or a manufacturing facility or a healthcare facility or a retail establishment brings. And so I think you're going to see this sort of cross section between more people doing more remote work, but also more people craving coming back to the office. And you'll probably see more of uh, which we're seeing a lot of, which is companies saying, you know, we, we still want everybody together, but we don't want to have everybody together from eight to five every single day, right? We'll yeah, do some sort staggered. of very schedules, exactly. Right. Um, and that very scheduled also, also can help with density, right? Because if you're sure. staging people, then you can have less, less people in the same space. Because that's another consideration is, man, are people going to be wanting to go back to these WeWork spaces where everybody's crammed on top of each other and yeah. popping in the same break rooms and you don't know where people have come and gone? I think the whole, you know, I think the co-working space is, 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 is significantly challenged, but I think in general environments are going to have to figure out how they, you know, how they deal with the greater demand for cleanliness. And this includes both keeping things clean and lots of wipes and those sort of things to having antibacterial materials built into construction. If you just think about walking up to a building, you grab a metal door handle, right? Yep. Well, that, that, that's probably not going to be the case in the future. You push an elevator button that's metal. Um, you know, so there's just a lot of materials that have been, that have been uh, hip and cool, you know, the stainless steel, but a lot of this stuff may not be the best for trans of uh, getting rid of the transmission of disease. And so I think you can see that. It'll be interesting to see if we see any kind of temperature scanning. 
Um, obviously, it's happening in China. I'm not seeing a lot of that movement today, but who knows? Depends on how long this thing goes and, and how hard it hits all of us. Yeah, I think it's possible. I think it is too, at, at least for some scenarios. You know? Sure. So what are the wrapping up? So what are some mindsets and strategies that you as a tenant can be thoughtful about? Well, first of all, it's really, really, really important to remember the world has changed. So take off the glasses of the last five to seven years where you were not in the driver's seat and the landlords were in the position of strength because it was a landlord's market. Now it's a tenant's market and it's only going to become more and more of a tenant's market. But don't be predatory. Don't try to take advantage of the situation, but be very mindful of who you are, the leverage you have and the buying power, because you're going to have huge opportunities in front of you and you want to be prepared and ready and focused. So as the right opportunities come, you're able to jump on them and capitalize on them because there are going to be a lot. And make sure that in, if, you're, if you're seeking help, make sure you're proactive, you're persistent in your communication, don't give up, look for creative solutions, look to, look to find things that may not be inherently obvious by understanding what the landlord's perspective is and where they're coming from and where their pain point is. If you just think about it, most tenants are not putting a really well put together rationale for why they need relief. They're being much more demanding than collaborative. And so if yeah. you just be different, you're going to rise to the top and they're going to want to work with you. You want your landlord to want to help you because contractually they don't have to. So yeah. this is one of those things where appeal to their best sense, come from a place of understanding, et cetera. And remember, at the end of the day, the last two downturns, everybody thought the world was ending. The world didn't end. It got strong again. The same thing's going to happen here and it could come back with a roar. And so if you as an organization cut too deep, then when this does come back, you're going to be playing catch up with everybody else that was positioned for the future. So you're going to be taking a mind towards the future in addition to seeking to survive and keep your costs manageable today. And then again, document, document, document. I can't say this enough. There's a lot of conversations that are going to be had where people feel like, hey, well, I talked to my property manager and she said it would be no problem for me to get some sort of relief. And then I get this letter from the landlord's attorney. You need to be you need to be documenting all your conversations, talking to decision makers, and make sure that your asks are very clearly, clearly stated. And remember, last point, at the end of the day, we're all in this together, right? This is, this is something that nobody is unaffected by. Landlords, tenants, other stakeholders, vendors, brokers, everybody's in this together. So if you take a collaborative spirit if you try to figure out, you know, that whole seek first to understand, then to be understood, if you do that, you as a tenant are going to have significantly greater chances of achieving material benefit to your organization, both in the short, mid, and long term. And if there's any way that my firm can be of assistance, again, we're one of the largest independent commercial real estate tenant firms in the country, and we are here to serve. We are here to help. And if we could be here to help you in any way, please let us know. We've also put some free resources together. You can find them on our website at kaiser.com. And again, take the mindset of survive today, do what you need to do, but take an eye towards the, towards the long game because when we come out of this, you're going to want to be well positioned for the future. This is fantastic. I want to thank you very much. I, I personally know businesses that are considered essential and businesses that are not considered essential. So I'm seeing both sides of it from, from a tenant standpoint. And I think there's a lot of good insight here. Um, I really like the communication forward, right? Be proactive about that and the collaborative aspect of it. You know, we are all in this together. It doesn't matter, you know, what business you are in, you have definitely been impacted to some degree. And so, you know, that collaborative aspect, I think that's going to be an important one. And, and to your point, you coming into it being collaborative are going to be much more received well yes. um, by, by that landlord because you know they're, they're hearing from lots of people so if you take that collaborative that intelligent approach um, I, I definitely think you will stand out so well thank you very much Jonathan I, I really appreciate you coming on board um, we look forward to sharing right. this with uh, other businesses and definitely uh, it's great that you have your contact information up here so definitely reach out to Jonathan and his team um, for any of your uh, your needs that you have so thank you very much it's our pleasure. Thanks for having me.